lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota, and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. Well, I want to start by welcoming new members to our Still Growing listener community on Facebook. It's a group called the Still Growing Podcast Group, and all you have to do if you'd like to join is go to Facebook, and in the search bar, type in Still Growing Podcast Group, and our group will pop right up. And then all you have to do is request to join, and once I verify that you're not a spammer, or a robot, you'll be in the group with these new members, including Amy Fairbanks Van Aken, Susan Harris, the editor of goodgardeningvideos.org, Ariana Rominski, Christy Harder, and Anna Thomas, the author of Vegan Vegetarian Omnivore, and Anna was featured back in episode 537, and she's returning to the show. So she'll be back on the show in early November, and Anna is going to be helping the gardeners that are taking on hosting responsibilities for this holiday season. So whether you're hosting Thanksgiving or Christmas or New Year's or any type of party in between, this is the time of year where we've got those big events. Or conversely, you might want the easy get together, something with friends, something that's still special, but maybe not this huge overpowering meal with all the responsibility that comes with it. So Anna is going to be on giving us all sorts of great ideas. So welcome new members, everyone, including Anna to the group. You know, the Facebook group is where I encourage listeners of the show and guests of the show to interact, to share their own garden experiences. And here's the secret. The group is also the only place where I post all of the really awesome garden giveaways and promotions from my guests and sponsors for my lucky listeners. So if you're ever interested in a giveaway that's associated with an episode, you need to be in the Still Growing Podcast group in order to be a winner. This week, we'll be giving away a copy of Marta McDowell's All the President's Gardens. And if you've been listening to the show for the last eight weeks, you know that we've been reading All the President's Gardens as part of our very first book club for Still Growing. And Marta has graciously offered to give away a copy of All the President's Gardens for lucky listeners. So stay tuned. Join the group. This would be the week to do it. If you want a copy of All the President's Gardens, you just might win it. The group is also where I curate and post articles that I find interesting throughout the week. So let me share a few of them to entice you a little bit. My husband had come home from work on Monday, and he had an opportunity to visit a Minnesota company that is exploring hydroponics in partnership with NASA, and they are growing kale and lettuce hydroponically in an experiment that they think will work on Mars. So that was very interesting. And so he's connecting me with his contacts there, and that might end up being a future episode. And then there was this picture that had gone a little bit viral in the gardening community, but I didn't want people in the group to miss it. So I shared it there as well. But the picture shows grass that's been braided. And it was almost like a French braid because it went around the outer perimeter of this clump of grass. So the grass in the middle is still standing, but along the outside wrapped all the way around is this kind of French braid that started low to the ground and then kind of worked its way up almost like a circular staircase um, going around the grass. But it looked super cool And people were remarking on it all over Facebook and Pinterest and all of the uh, very visual social media sites this week. And I shared it in the group as well. So if you haven't had a chance to see it, head on over to the group and you'll be able to take a look. In addition, Bon Appetit magazine had shared a recipe for a Brussels sprout dish. It was Brussels sprouts with walnuts, courtesy of food director Carla Lolly Music. And she talks about how important this is, this particular side dish, to her Thanksgiving. 
she shares that there is this painstaking process that's involved with preparing these Brussels sprouts. And what they do in her family is her dad takes each tiny little cabbage, each little Brussels sprout, and he cuts out the core of the Brussels sprout. And by taking out that little core, the leaves of the Brussels sprout kind of fall to the cutting board table, and then they're ready to be prepared for this Brussels sprout dish. And so they use olive oil and walnuts and walnut oil. It sounds fantastic. And then because the Brussels sprouts aren't in those tight little cabbages, they cook differently. They're crispy. And it sounds fantastic. So that's in the Facebook group this week as well. NPR shared a very interesting article this week on how the giant sequoias are handling the drought. And there are scientists that have really been paying attention to these trees. In fact, they've been climbing the trees and going through each branch to see how they are faring with the drought conditions there. And what they've turned to recently is drones because the drones have been able to go up high into the canopy of these trees and then read the light that is reflected off the canopy. And that reflected light tells them about the health of the crown of the tree itself. It tells them the water content and other chemicals like chlorophyll content, and that's all tied into photosynthesis and nitrogen content. So very interesting article there on how those sequoias, which in some cases are 1600 years old, how they're faring against these drought conditions while other parts of the forest are not doing as well. So a fascinating article if you're interested in that kind of thing. Martha Stewart recently shared a post about something that she had done inside of her vegetable greenhouse that I thought was really a great idea and so economical. But what she did is she had some guys go out and get some huge logs and bring them to her property and then chop them into chunks. So imagine like a three foot section or a four or five foot section, different heights. And then they set those around the perimeter of her greenhouse inside and then also kind of staggered throughout. And what she did with these logs of different heights is she used them as pedestals for her containers. So instead of having everything just at one level sitting on the greenhouse floor, she's now got them elevated. I tell you what, as a six foot tall gardener, I love that idea because no stooping over. And I like seeing things at different heights. I think it makes it way more interesting, so much easier to get at those pots, those containers and look at the soil line, see how things are doing. I just thought it was fantastic. So I think it's something that we can incorporate not just in a greenhouse, but throughout the garden. So if you want to do that, I think it's a very economical plant stand, a great way to elevate containers in the garden. Just get a log, set it in, and done. You're there. The trick would be getting help to help you set those logs in place because they're pretty heavy. And she mentioned that in the article that these things are like backbreakers. So keep that in mind. But I thought it was a genius idea. So if you happen to be somewhere where you've got big logs laying around and you want plant stands or you like this idea, go for it. You'll love it. And there's pictures of that on the post. Uh, Lots of pictures. In fact, she included, I want to say like 20 pictures of this. So give it a look. I think it's fantastic. It's a great idea. It's totally doable. I can do it. You can do it. And of course, Martha Stewart can do it. Well, that gives you an idea of some of the posts that I curated for the group, the Still Growing Community in Facebook. It's called the Still Growing Podcast Group. And if you'd like to join, go ahead, look it up, click to join. I'd love to meet you in the Still Growing Podcast Group. Well, today's interview is something I've been looking forward to for over two months as I've been reading All the President's Gardens by Marta McDowell. And Marta lives and writes in gardens in Chatham, New Jersey, and she shares her garden with her husband, Kirk. And Kirk often says that he can sum up Marta's biography with just one sentence, and it would be, I am, therefore I dig. Marta loves to garden. She loves history, and she actually teaches at the New York Botanical Garden. 
She wrote about Beatrix Potter's gardening life, which won a 2014 Gold Award from the Garden Writers Association. And her first book was about Emily Dickinson's gardens, and that came out in 2005. Now, at the end of the interview, Marta is going to tell us about her new book that's coming out next year. But I'm not going to ruin the surprise. I'm going to let her tell you herself. I will say it sounds like another hit book for Marta McDowell. Well, hi there, Marta. Welcome to Still Growing. Thanks, Jennifer. Happy to be here. Well, I am so excited to have you on the show because I am fascinated by you. I think you have the perfect job. It's a, a great blend of both history and gardening. So, it, and as we were talking in the pre chat, I know you said how enjoyable it is and you get to speak in gardens. I think anytime it, someone is doing something that they absolutely love, it is just so powerful. And one of the ways that you focused in on your pursuit as a garden history writer is by following what you call the relationship between the pin and the trowel. How did you come to be? a garden history writer? Like many of life's journeys, it's had a lot of twists and turns. (laughs) I was an American studies major in college, and I remember really vividly one day my father, who was a man of few words, saying, not in a, a harsh tone, just saying, couldn't you take something so you could get a job? (laughs) <laughs> so I took, let's see, nine credits of computer science, which at the time was enough to get me an entry-level job at Prudential, where I worked for 20 years and had a very nice career. Wow. Uh, but I always, I always loved history, and I always loved to garden. And so it was really just an avocation at that time. These things happen. So really, it's a second career for me. I really got smitten with garden history at a place called Dumbarton Oaks. It's a garden in Georgetown near Washington, D.C. And there was a woman landscape designer who had done the design. Her name was Beatrix Sarand, and I'd never heard of her. And I thought, who is this woman? And, you know, so she lived up until, I think, the 50s, 1950s. And so that sort of started, and then I happened to bump into Emily Dickinson having a garden on a business trip, of all things. So, you know, (laughs) as I said, a circuitous route. And then Prudential decided to fund my midlife crisis with a nice separation package. Oh, that's fantastic. Out of curiosity, what did you do for Prudential for 20 years? Oh, I worked in operations and systems. I ran the technical training area, all sorts of things, lots of writing. So, you know, oh, wow. I think this is what I say to people who are changing careers, and I teach a lot of them now at the New York Botanical Garden. Nothing is wasted. Anything that you have done in a prior, you know, phase of your life, you will be able to use in some new way. Well, I like that. You know, it's so true. When I was in high school, one of my first jobs was working at a radio station, and here I am doing a podcast. So things do come full circle. And recently, I've been helping my daughter with her Algebra 2. And when she doesn't get it, I'll say, guess what? You get another crack at it when you're in college, because I guarantee you're going to end up taking Algebra as a freshman in college. And then she just looks at me with this look of total mortification. And then just to rub it in, I'll say, guess what? And you get to do it again when you have kids, because inevitably you're going to end up helping your kids with algebra too. So I said, look at me, here I am in my mid forties and I'm now on my second time doing algebra two because Emma's my second and I'll get to do it two more times over the next couple of years before everything's said and done. And then I suppose in another generation. If I live so long, I'll get another crack at algebra too. So, and I have to say every time I teach it to one of my kids, I learn it just a little bit better. Absolutely. And I always like to think that it's easier to learn something when you're not being tested on it because you can be relaxed about it and not so worried. So I think there's something to that as well. Well, Marta, you have had such rich experiences in the field of horticulture including fabulous internship opportunities at gardens, of course, writing and researching gardens. And I read on your website that your husband, Kirk, sums up your biography best by saying, I am, therefore I dig. How do you, Marta McDowell, incorporate gardening into your daily life? 
Well, I think he says that because he always knows where to find me, which is out <laughs> in the garden somewhere. <laughs> you know, there are those horrible little cutouts that people used to put in their yards of like a woman leaning over with her butt in the air. Oh, gosh. That's sort of like, that's always my, you know, I've always been head down in the garden. Um so I love to garden, even though I I write. So, you know, that's sort of counterintuitive, right? I spend a lot of my time sitting at a keyboard in front of a screen. But I would say I'm out in the garden probably an hour or two every day. Oh, you I, are? Uh, yes, yes. I love to garden. I just, you know, dink around with weeding and deadheading and what was the children's books the, the character said they always like to be messing about in boats? Is that Wind in the Willows? Yeah, Wind in the Willows. Well, I like to be messing about in the dirt. Oh. I just find it a wonderful thing. You know, it's I get up early in the morning. I live in the suburbs. So if you go out in the middle of the day, invariably someone is having their lawn mowed. Yes. So I get up early in the morning and, you know, I just fill up a couple of buckets full of refuse and then go dump it in the compost. It's very life-giving, isn't it? Absolutely. It keeps me sane. That's right. Well, you were inspired to write this book by a short paper that had been written by one of your students. Seamus, is it McLennan? McLennan, yes. McLennan. Got it. Okay, so are your horticulture landscape history students inspiring to you, especially for your work as a writer? Oh, always. So, you know, it's a funny story, Jennifer, but this this whole idea of writing a book about the history of American gardening really came from my editor, who's wonderful. His name is Tom Fisher at Timber Press. And I had, I had asked him about, you know, would he be interested in a book about the transcendentalist crowd, you know, those like Emerson and Thoreau and Louisa May Alcott. And, and you know, they were all in and around Concord, Massachusetts, and they all gardened together. Yes. And huh. Tom said, well... Uh, I'd buy it, but I don't think anyone else would. <laughs> I'd buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I thought it was a really good idea. I think it's a great and idea. So, oh, well, you know, send Tom a letter. Um, and so he said, what about a history of American gardening? You know, Timber Press, they're a garden publisher, so they hadn't done one in a while. And that sounded, I hope I can say this, it sounded to me like a really long and very boring project. <laughs> And so, I mean, it really is true. Seamus had done this paper, and I wrote to him and said, well, may I use your, may I basically steal your idea? And so he said yes, and so off I went, because it gave me a little a little window. But students, so I teach adults. I admire people who teach children. I find groups of children really frightening. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I teach adults, they're, some of them have just graduated college, uh, and they're, they've come uh, for the School of Professional Horticulture. But I have a lot of uh, people who, like me, have come into this world after some other career, be it, you know, raising children or a corporate career. I've had doctors and lawyers and you name it. Yes. So they just, everyone has such a unique view of things. And so I do have them do small research projects. And it, it's amazing what I learned from them. Uh, just amazing. So, you know, yes, they're always an inspiration. And, you know, I teach horticulture classes as well. And they're always teaching me new plants. Well, I always think teachers have a constant source of inspiration in their students. So I'm glad to hear you're taking advantage of it. It's just fabulous. Well, we'd be remiss to talk about your book without mentioning the amazing, and I mean totally gorgeous, illustrations that are in the pages of this book. How on earth do you determine whether an image will make the book, and then how do you secure rights to use these historical images? So I, when I first wrote, I wrote a book about Emily Dickinson. And I had this idea that, you know, the author wrote the book and then someone else found all the images. And that is not true. So, <laughs> you know, you're on the hook to provide text 
and all the illustrations. And, you know, it's really just kind of one at a time. Uh, for this book in particular, the president's book, uh, I started with the Library of Congress. You can go online. They have a, you know, a prints and photographs catalog, and you put in search terms like White House Gardens. <laughs> okay. And see what comes up. So that was certainly a help. Uh, the Smithsonian has something called the Archives of American Gardens. They were helpful. Uh, historical societies, uh, the National Archives, the presidential libraries, a lot of old books. I have a lot of old, you know, gardening and horticulture books on my shelf. And I think the most surprising one was Ancestry. Okay. So Ancestry.com? If, yeah, Ancestry.com. So I got quite interested in the White House gardeners, these 14 men who have been the head gardeners at the White House since 1800 or thereabouts. And so I started doing research on ancestry and I got in touch with some of their relations who were nice enough to provide photographs. So that was really great. Oh my gosh. You know, I'm active on ancestry. I absolutely love it. Yeah. I think my tree right now has over 13,000 people in it. I started it about six years ago, and I just absolutely love it. Sometime I'll have to tell you about this um, family mystery I stumbled on. But it is tremendous, isn't it? The amount of material that's on there and all the little absolutely anecdotal is. stories. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the stories are fantastic. Wow. So you had also asked about rights. Yeah. And how do you rights- do that? Yeah, rights are uh, tricky. For Again, for this book, if something had been taken, if a photograph had been taken by a an employee of the federal government, that is by its nature in the public domain. So that was very helpful. Okay. Um, and then all of the others, you basically have to pay. So if you had a, a, you know, a newspaper photographer who took a picture and you wanted to use it, you have to go to whoever still holds those rights. It might be the publication or it might be a service like Corpus uh, or Getty Images, and you have to pay them. So again, uh, you know, that's something that if you are you know, you're interested in this kind of writing, you have to handle. <laughs> and the other thing was, wow. I, I at one point thought, I'm going to have to write this book without ever having been in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> because it's much harder to get access to than you think, if you're me. Because I'm like, you know, Pollyanna, and I think, oh, well, that will be no problem. <laughs> <laughs> So I actually, I, I had the help of my congressman and his able staff, you know, to kind of work your way through getting access uh, to the White House grounds. So, wow. <laughs> there you go. And is it a lot bigger when you're, when you're actually there? Uh, it was the other way. It seemed smaller. Really? To me. So I had been around the perimeter. I mean, I really did feel like somebody at the zoo. I would be walking around, you know, seeing what I could <laughs> From outside the fence, I never climbed the fence, and I did not send a drone over. <laughs> um, but uh, when you go in, it's a lot of it is taken up. Now, there is a really big central lawn, but around that lawn, there are loads of trees and big trees. So the amount of, like, kind of arable space, it's amazing that Michelle Obama could we use the vegetable garden in. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that is crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Now, were there any illustrations or images that you wanted to secure but were not able to? Uh, mostly I was able to get them. It was a matter of, like, could I, was I willing to cough up that much money? <laughs> <laughs> and some of them were kind of surprising, uh, and I, but I just kind of fell in love with them. And really wanted them. There's one of Thalassa Crusoe, who was this TV gardening personality, kind of from my youth. 
Okay. And so it was very meaningful to me. And I bought on eBay, which is actually another great source of historic material from a certain era, you know, sort of 19th century forward. Hmm. I bought this old, it was called the TV Preview, and it was like the TV Guide of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I thought, oh, this is great. I'll be able to use this. And then I realized, well, no, it's not old enough. I don't know. It was from the, probably the 60s. Okay. And so I had to pay them. I won't say how much, but rather healthy sum. Really? Wow. <laughs> for the rights. And so, you know, and it's, you know, that's intellectual property. And so that's all, you know, it, it makes sense. But Yeah. Wow. How about the image everything. on the cover? How about the image on the cover of the book? Because it's beautiful. Uh, yeah, the image on the cover was from an old uh, real photo postcard. So that, again, was something I bought on eBay. Oh, you're kidding. Yeah. Wow, the colors are gorgeous, aren't they? Yes. Well, that, you know, it's quite possible that the art director at Timber Press had something to do with the color. <laughs> Enhanced um, a little bit. Yes, a little. But you can, but one thing I like about it is you can really see the conservatories that are on the west side. So, you know, nowadays that's the West Wing, but then it was all class houses. Huh. And n- not a lot of trees obstructing this particular view. No, this is pretty, uh, you know, this is kind of late 19th century. So you see all the pattern beds and the trees were still pretty small. Yeah. Wow. Is that reflecting pool still there? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, there's still a central fountain. There uh, is. In the front. There's one in the back too. Hmm. Uh, but not, you know, now it's uh, the front porch, if you will. The North Portico is pretty much not obscured, but uh, Truman's Boxwoods are in front, and they still call them Truman's Boxwoods because he planted them. Oh, so we've well, gotten our money's worth out of those. Yeah, we have. That's amazing, <laughs> isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Now, the structure for your book, All the President's Gardens, is so helpful because you basically follow the chronological timeline, which had to help with the writing of it as well. And you include the spouses of the presidents in the outlines of the book, which I thought was a lovely gesture since it's a family home after all. And it starts in the 1790s. So in the 1790s, the land for the capital and its gardens is being secured, and you wrote that it all started with a transaction, and that the founding fathers were securing public lands from Virginia and Maryland, but also from private parties. And you had this fun little snippet in there that Washington referred to one of the parties as, quote, the obstinate Mr. Burns. I love that little tidbit. So after the grounds are secured from the public entities and then the private entities like the obstinate Mr. Burns, the grounds had to be designed. How were the early White House grounds laid out, Marta? Well, they were fairly formal. So, you know, if you think about Washington, D.C., it's really very French in feeling. It's got these long diagonal avenues and kind of, well, it, it's what makes traffic in Washington, D.C. so incredibly impossible. Um, but it's got, you know, sort of circles and diagonals. And so it was very geometric. And you have to think of it as a blank canvas. Right, because this was a city that was built from scratch, basically on top of the swamp, which has other other problems. But the White House gardens themselves were, you know, were equally formal, you know, in concept at the start. So there would have been like alleys of trees and, you know, shrubberies and groves. Uh, and there would have been a fairly substantial fruit and vegetable garden because it really helped to you know, support the kitchen at the White House. Uh, early on, the president paid for all the entertaining uh, at the White House or at the, you know, executive mansion um, out of their own pocket. Hmm. So it was almost like a mini farm as well. 
Well, George Washington was a complete plantaholic, which I didn't realize until I was reading your book. And he would have been a dangerous person to go to a plant sale with because he single-handedly would have filled up my van and there wouldn't have been any space for my plants. But he got America off to a great gardening start between Mount Vernon, which I happened to visit last summer, and I have to say that was an unexpected, very pleasant surprise. It's absolutely gorgeous. And the White House. So can you share a little bit about how plant crazy George really was? (laughs) Well, I like your image of him at the plant sale. (laughs) Because from my rock garden society, you always know the real plant nuts because they line up outside the ropes a half hour before (laughs) the plant sale starts and they bring their own boxes. Yes. So they are ready to just run right in. And George would have been right there with him. Uh, He loved to visit nurseries. So even when he was, you know, in the Continental Congress or, you know, sort of on campaign, he would sort of (laughs) take a detour to go off to Bartram's or to William Prince's nursery. He was forever writing to relatives and friends to please, you know, please send plants, please send cuttings, please send seeds of anything that you think will grow for me. Uh, he added a big orangery, like a, his own glass house, to the grounds at Mount Vernon. And he just liked to experiment. I, I think if he'd had his way, that there would have been a botanic garden right adjacent to the White House. That, you know, kind of came later. There is one near the Capitol now. Um, but, you know, there were initial plans, and that sort of never got carried out. Because Washington... You know, I equate him to Moses, right? He got to kind of design the White House and, you know, cite it, but he never lived there himself. So uh, I think he would have brought a lot of plants because he tried out so many at Mount Vernon. I mean, really, literally, he he got a plant catalog from Bartram. It was sort of a plant, you know, a list of plants available. And he basically ordered one of each for more. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. I wanted his budget. That's what I wanted. <laughs> yes. Well, he's a gardener after my own heart. I mean, it is so hard to rein it in if you are <laughs> in love with something. So I can relate to that. That's for sure. Oh, yes. It's bulb order time. Yeah, for me. So it that's is. It's always very scary. Yes. It's very difficult to, to hold yourself back when it's time to order spring bulbs. That's for sure. And then when you're planting all of them, then you're then you're saying, oh. now, why did I do this to myself? Oh. Never. And when the boxes come on my front porch, I go, oh, my God. What am I <laughs> it's crazy. You know, I just did two episodes this fall with some gals, and we were covering... Uh, ordering tulips and daffodils and all kinds of spring bulbs from Color Blends and then from Van England and John Sheepers. And those episodes were so great because I was on with other garden bloggers and we were just dying of laughter talking about how addicted we were to spring bulbs, but then also how crazy it can be because you walk out in the spring and sometimes you're like, did I plant that? I don't even remember ordering red red tulips. So our rational minds get completely hijacked with the frenzy of ordering spring bulbs. We can totally relate to that. Yes. Well, Thomas Jefferson, who you referenced as America's patron saint of gardening, is famous for the beautiful gardens at Monticello, but he didn't pursue implementing beautiful gardens around the White House because it would have echoed the grounds of the castles of the European monarchs. And of course, nobody wanted uh, the United States to have a monarchy. Yes. So instead, you shared this sweet story of Jefferson having a pet bird, a mockingbird named Dick, which I just thought, are you kidding me? Way back then, I, I just couldn't believe that. And he had, uh, when I was researching this, he had elaborate names for his horses and his sheepdogs, like French names and uh, Roman, Latin names, that type of thing. But he had this mockingbird named Dick, which was totally hilarious. Yes. (laughs) And I read that Jefferson had many mockingbirds, which he occasionally wrote about. And he documented their activity in this weather memorandum book, and he shared lots of little details. So, for instance, on January 22nd, 1806, he writes, New Orleans Mockingbird Begins to Sing. 
And then two years later, in January on the 31st, in 1808, he writes, The Old Mockingbird Sings. And then March 2nd, 1808, he writes, The Middle-Aged Mockingbird Sings. But this is how we know that Dick was his favorite bird, because on March 3rd, 1808, he wrote, Dick Sings. So Dick the Mockingbird had a name. He wasn't just the old bird or the middle-aged bird. He actually had a name. He was unquestionably Jefferson's favorite mockingbird. And you wrote that Dick's cage had a special place in Jefferson's study right in the White House. Well, I am so glad, Jennifer, that you found the name of Jefferson's Mockingbird hilarious. (laughs) Because I remember when I found that little tidbit bursting out laughing. Now, part of it is because, you know, when I grew up, I can remember vividly, you know, my brother was 10 years older than I was, and he and my father would get into political discussions sometimes. And I remember Dick as in Richard Nixon being, you know, bandied about the dinner table. So I just found that hilarious. But uh, it's funny, when I mentioned that in, in talks, not everybody finds that funny, so I just have started leaving <laughs> that out. Anyway, uh, back to Thomas Jefferson. So when Jefferson arrives at the White House, it is still basically a construction site, right? So it's not really finished. So he kind of focuses on finishing it up, and he abbreviates the, the grounds. It, it used to go, if you think about now, it went to the Washington Monument and beyond, all the way to the Potomac, was considered the grounds of the, quote, presidential palace. And that is not what he wanted. So he says, no, no, we're going to cut it off. He built actually a wall, a sort of ha-ha ditch. And uh, that's going to be all we'll have. And then he did do up a plan, he and Benjamin Latrobe, who was the architect. They left a plan that I think was basically followed over the years, you know, with sort of a cur- the curving drive and uh, kind of, uh, you know, various shrubberies and groves. He was all, all for that. Um, but he didn't really do planting at the White House. Dick, however, was in the indoor garden. So Jefferson did have plants. Uh, according to one of his friends, he grew roses, um, inside at the White House, as well as geraniums. So they were in his, quote, cabinet, his study, which is what is now the state dining room. So it has nice south-facing windows. And evidently, Dick had a cage right in amongst the plants. So how nice was that? I know. Isn't that crazy? I just, It just doesn't seem to fit, does it, with everything you think you know about Jefferson, that he, that he has this bird. It's crazy. That he had, had birds. Yes, and I thought, how weird that he had caged wild birds. You know, it just seemed odd to me. Now, I say that. I have a crested cockatiel, but I don't know. I found it odd that he would have a mockingbird. And then I found an old catalog. It was the Iowa Bird Catalog from something like, I don't know, 1905, 1910. They were still selling mockingbirds. Oh, you're kidding. So, no, up until the early 20th century. So evidently this was done. I had read that there, they people did catch hummingbirds, which seemed kind of strange. But um, anyway, wow. uh, caged mockingbirds were still being sold. I found it in a catalog and I was absolutely floored. Yeah, it's nuts. Well, this set me on a little bit of uh, my own research because I thought I've got to I've got to learn more about this. But apparently, he would let this bird out. He would play the fiddle, and this bird would come flying out and sing. He this bird had like free reign. And then uh, somebody had recounted this tale where that he'd gone on a trip to France over. So he's on a ship, and he and he brings a, one of his mockingbirds with. After this trip, the bird would incorporate the creaking sounds of the ship into <laughs> the singing <laughs> that this bird would do. And I, I just thought, oh, my gosh, this is just insane. So it's fascinating. It's totally fascinating. It's- yes, but I believe it because our cockatiel, <laughs> if I were downstairs, uh, he might be imitating my talking, which to him sounds like. Oh, gosh. <laughs> nice. <laughs> For a while, he used to do soda cans. Like, you'd go, when you open oh, soda Oh, really? Cans. 
but I don't drink as much soda anymore. So oh, he's kind of gotten off that. <laughs> Good job, Marta. Good job. Well, now he can imitate the little sounds your phone probably makes. Because think about all those little sounds, you know? Oh, yes. He loves the dialing on the iPhone. <laughs> he does? Yes, love oh, that sound. Oh, my sound. gosh. Well, any new homeowner that's walked into a terrible garden situation can totally relate to the state of the White House garden of James and Dolly Madison in 1811. Can you read, there is an entertaining passage with a quote from Thomas Law, and then expound on this era in the garden. It's on um, page 57 and 58, and it starts with, it was time. Certainly. So just to set the scene. So Thomas Jefferson leaves. He has left this garden plan, but basically has not done anything on the grounds except build this wall. Uh, and so James and Dolly Madison come in, uh, and here goes the passage. It was time. Thomas Law, a real estate speculator in the city, left this description in 1811, tisking and shaking his head. When I perceive the president's house unfinished, his garden in gullies, and the rooms of his house unplastered, when the rain drips on my head through the roof of the Capitol, when I survey the neglected spot allotted to a garden, which costs 30 dimes, oh, excuse me, $30 per acre, I ask, can these disgusting scenes to strangers be pleasing to citizens? So that's what Thomas Law thought about it. He it was, was not impressed. He was not impressed. So again, you, you know, you go to Washington, D.C. now, it's all very, you know, sort of tidy. Then it was really a construction zone. And so the area between Capitol Hill and the president's house was just, you know, kind of a mess. And even around the Capitol and the White House. So just... A real mess at that time. So it was it was James Madison who really got started on the plant orders and actually putting plants in the ground around the president's house. And so that was the first plant order that I found that was from the president. And again, it was up to uh, to John Bartram uh, in Philadelphia, the Bartram sons, really. Oh, isn't that interesting? Was that an exciting order to look at? Oh, it was great. And especially, so in addition to trees and shrubs, and there are things, you know, you and I might order for our garden. You sure. Know, roses, Rose of Sharon and lilacs and things like that. There were lots of vegetable seeds. So it really gave you a feeling not just for what they were growing and the, you know, the really wide range of vegetables that were available um, to grow, but also what they were eating. So, you know. There's a book, Founding Foodies, that's all about, you know, what the what the Founding Fathers eat. And I, I find that uh, that kind of thing, it personalizes these people that other, you know, other than that, I think of them as, you know, portraits on money. <laughs> that's right. Well, it's like that, um, it's like that little tidbit that, that they throw in magazines now and they say, celebrities, just like us. Well, founding fathers, just like us. They've got to buy plants. <laughs> They've got to eat vegetables. <laughs> I like that. Well, there are parts of this book that touch on the history of American gardening in general, that kind of overarching topic that was overwhelming at first, the topic your editor wanted you to write about. And one that comes to mind is where you share about the impact of the shakers. And I thought it would be fun to have you finish this sentence starter. The shakers innovated gardening by... Standardizing seed distribution. So the shakers, it was this community, this kind of decentralized communities across sort of the North and the Midwest, primarily. And so they would have these communities, and the brothers and sisters lived separately. They were celibate, uh, but they were known for their industry. And uh, they started putting seeds, so they would grow and clean and package seeds, and they packaged them in little paper envelopes. 
uh, and eventually they had standardized them and sort of pre-printed them. So they were all the same size. And um, the Shaker brothers would take around for sort of traveling sales reps, if you will, and they'd either sell the seed directly to farmers, or in many cases, they would leave consignments of seed boxes. So they'd have boxes of seeds out for a general store to sell. And so nowadays, you know, you go to, uh, you know, a hardware store, a supermarket, a garden center, and we're used to seeing these racks of seeds. And I had just never thought of, well, where did that come from? Right? So why are they in these little paper envelopes? It's practical. But anyway, they really innovated that. And uh, James Madison was aware of the Shakers. He corresponded with one of his contacts about Shaker seedsmen and growing on this certain variety of cabbage. And so I used that as a little transition to talk about the Shakers and their importance to this whole you know, industry that we have now, really, that's how is seed distributed. So, you know, now we talk about, you know, what's happening with GMOs and, you know, et cetera. And it has a history, too. So that's kind of fun. Yes. Well, and what was nice about it is you're kind of placing it in its place in history relative to where, you know, the president, uh, the sequence of the president. So that was helpful to me. And I wanted to spend some time chatting with you about one of the most charming presidential gardeners to me, and that's John Quincy Adams. Gardening was therapeutic to him. So I thought it would be fun if you read the excerpt on page 71, where you share that the garden was a place for John Quincy Adams where he could find personal restoration and then chat a little bit about the self-care and also the curiosity-driven relationship that he had with gardening. Sure thing. So, again, just to, to do a little setup, John Quincy Adams, before I started this project, I could have told you he was the son of John and Abigail Adams, and that's probably about it. <laughs> Um, so I was absolutely entranced with John Quincy Adams because I read a lot of his diaries. He was a lifelong diarist and they're all available actually online now. Um, so here's the passage. Uh, with his presidency faltering, well, I'll start at the first one. It was evident that the second president Adams, like the first, would be gone after one term. With his presidency faltering, John Quincy Adams was depressed. His father died. Like something out of a novel, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, reconciled in their later years, died on the same day, the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, July 4, 1826. John Quincy wrote in his diary, My health and spirits droop, and the attempt to sustain them by botany, the natural history of trees, And the purpose of naturalizing exotics is almost desperate. Gardening was a personal act, so different from the burden of office. In the garden, he could suit himself. I love that. I love that part. In the garden, he could suit himself. So just like everyone else that has gardening as a hobby, when life gets overwhelming, it's a great place to go to get a break. And I'm sure that his wife and his staff, they all knew that they could find him there whenever he had a moment to himself. Yes. And he learned to garden while he was president. So he came to gardening in later life. And I will tell you, I have a real soft spot for late bloomers. (laughs) (laughs) Me too. You know, for people who try something different when they're not when they're no longer in their first phase, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, he's a total beginner, a total newbie. And the White House gardener, John Oosley, he was an Irishman. He teaches John Quincy Adams how to garden. And John Quincy Adams was absolutely bitten by the bug. I mean, he loved to try to start seeds. Of, he would pick up acorns from places he visited. If he was having cherries for dinner, he would spit out the pits and go plant them outside oh the next morning. <laughs> so, and and he again, he was a great record keeper. And God bless all of the you know these presidents who kept great records because then you know what he planted, 
Uh, there's even a, a picture, which I absolutely love, in the book of um, a little seedling of an apple tree that he has planted. And his propagation record is written on it. I'm, I'm a little sorry that they didn't do it full page because it's a little hard to read. I can just make it out. My, my eyes are not as good as they used to be. Um, but it's the first time it's ever been in print outside of the Massachusetts Historical Society where the original is. <laughs> so anyway, I, I fell in love with John Quincy Adams, who, I, I don't know, um, some, one of my friends wrote and said, you know, I always thought of him as sort of a stuffed shirt until I read this book. Um, it's really very poignant. Uh, yes. And his, his, the rest of his life story is so interesting. So he's sort of a miserable president. You know, he, he got in really on a technicality, I will say. He did not win. He, he won neither the popular nor the electoral vote. Hmm. And he still got to be president. So he's in for one term. Basically, everybody's against him. And he leaves. He goes home to Massachusetts for a couple of years. Then in 1830, he is elected to Congress, to the House. And he serves for the rest of his life and dies, actually, in the House of Representatives very staunch early abolitionist um, and really very well respected. Wow. So it, it's got a great ending too. Yes. It's a really great story. Yes. Well, the folks that become gardeners late in life can certainly identify with JQ. At 59, he was bummed out that he hadn't mastered gardening and he wished he had started at a younger age. And then you wrote that he consoled himself with a quote, a quote that was in Latin from Virgil, and it says, non omnia possumus omnes. Yes. And I'm going to have you share that, what it means, and then offer up what words of wisdom you would have for gardeners that find themselves in John Quincy Adams' position, starting to garden at middle age. And then to add to that, if you don't mind, in your opinion, is garden mastery easier to come by these days with all of the online resources? Ah. Uh. Well, okay. Well, first we'll start with the translation. So the Virgil translation is, we can't all do everything. Uh, as you get older, you realize this is more and more true because there's only so much time. And so um, that's kind of a, a downer. But on the other hand, you can all... I don't know. You can do anything, but not everything. Yeah. <laughs> it's the way yes. I think of it now. So pick a few things that you really love, yeah. you know, as he did, and uh, and go for it. In terms of now, is it any easier? So John Quincy Adams, the way he went about learning, was, I think, the best way to learn how to garden, which is find a great gardener and attach yourself to them for a while. Yeah, I learned so much from people at the New York Botanical Garden and people at other gardens where I've interned, I can't even describe the, you know, those are the lessons that you really carry with you. Yes, the internet is great. You can find the, you know, some someone was telling me this morning about some, some vinegar concoction she sprays on her patio that she found on Pinterest. That's <laughs> great. But you have to garden by doing. And so I, I honestly believe that some form of apprenticeship is still the best way to become a good gardener. Yep. You have to grow it to know it. <laughs> I love that. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's one of my favorite sayings. Well, you start the section on the mid to late 1800s with a quote from Mary Todd Lincoln that says, we have the most beautiful flowers and grounds imaginable and company and excitement enough to turn a wiser head than my own. This was such an exciting time for the White House garden. And I always say that at this point, if the White House had been on Love It or List It, they would have decided that they were loving it and that they were going to stay. But it really was a beautiful time. Yes. Yeah. So despite the Civil War, they still had, you know, they had these glass houses at the White House where they grew many, many indoor plants. Um, and it was sort of, there's a description from 
one of the employees that talks about it being like a sort of southern plantation, right? The White House is really a southern home. Um, and, you know, having flowers as well as fruits and vegetables and sort of that kind of casual atmosphere. Absolutely true. Well, the glass houses alone had to be pretty impressive. Yes, up to, up till 1900, and they got bigger and bigger. So it, it was really, it was as much glass house as it was White House. At one time. That's amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, there was a designer that had come to the White House at this time, and that was Andrew Jackson Downing. Kind of ironic because he was named after President Andrew Jackson, like so many others, uh, a peers of his at that time. Um, and I looked him up. He was very good looking. And here he is. He's this young guy. He's famous in the world of horticulture. He's an accomplished author. He's the editor of two journals. And I also had read that New York City owes him a debt of gratitude because he had argued that New York needed a park, and that ultimately became Central Park. But his plans for the White House sadly never materialized. Would you share how his story ended and then what you think the White House grounds would have looked like if Andrew Jackson Downing had been able to design them? So this is 1850-ish, 1852 actually, and Downing is in his early 30s. And Downing has made a really big splash. I don't, I don't even know who to equate him to. Uh, in terms of his fame, it was almost like Martha Stewart, right? So, you know, everybody knew who he was. So he had, he was doing plans for the Smithsonian grounds, essentially the mall and uh, the president's grounds as well. And he was on his way to Washington, D.C., traveling by steamship, which was very common in those days. He was coming from, uh, from Poughkeepsie, so up by Albany, and uh, his steamship sank. And with it, the plans for the White House grounds. Um, and again, he was in his early 30s. And so he's the most famous American landscape designer you've never heard of. Because basically, he died young. And people like Frederick Law Olmsted sort of picked up the banner and kept running with it. So if you think about, you know, the kinds of parks that Olmsted designed, sort of, you know, sort of rolling, again, lots of trees. That is what Downing would have done. And and eventually, Olmsted's son, who, by the way, was also Frederick Law Olmsted, um, does the plan for the White House. It's actually the plan that they still follow. And so, in a way, Downing did design the White House ground. Um, and so, that that has a certain nice symmetry to it, if you will. Yeah, very touching. It was so sad, though. I mean, my God, 30 years old, or like, what was he, 32 or something? Yeah, very something tragic. Like and, and to me, the, the most poignant thing is, so he's on this steamship, it's a passenger steamship, uh, with his wife and his mother-in-law, so his wife's mother, and both he and his mother-in-law died that day. <sighs> so here is his wife, who loses in one day her husband and her mother. Mm. Really yeah, sad. yeah. The two pl- two people that most women are closest to. Yeah, very yeah. tragic. And all because the captains were racing. So it was his ship and another ship came out of Albany at the same time, and they were racing to see who could get to New York to do the fastest. Oh, senseless. Yeah, yeah. Did not need to happen. No. Well, I was also quite taken with the story of Mary Todd Lincoln and her use of bouquets. And you beautifully describe how her bouquet man would make them on page 99. So let's have you read this charming passage and then tell us how bouquets were used as a substitute for formal visits. Okay, sure thing. So, um... The Lincolns had two boys, Willie and Tad, who lived with them uh, at the White House. Their older son was uh, was actually off in the Army. And the boys had uh, playmates. Their names were Taft. It was no relation to William Howard Taft, but um, 
their older sister was Julia Taft. So that's the Julia we're talking about. Uh, and she was, uh, she would act as sort of a babysitter, you know, for this group of boys. Uh, so, as a treat, Mrs. Lincoln would often send her off to the conservatory for the bouquet man to make up flowers for Julia to take home. Bouquets were a floral largesse sent in place of a formal visit by the president's wife. Julia Taft described the bouquet maker's process. He would take a perfect flower, rose, cape jasmine, or camellia, and with his assistant tying the short-stemmed flowers onto broom straws, build up a structure of the size and shape of a cabbage with an edging of forget-me-nots or delicate ferns. This was then put into a stiff paper bouquet holder and was ready for presentation. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? <laughs> so there is a mini lesson on how to make a bouquet, yep. uh, you know, a la the White House bouquet man. So... Again, it was you have to put yourself in mind of this was the time when people would make social calls. And social calls were an obligation. So if someone would come, they would leave your, their card, and you would have to reciprocate. And so there was this whole language of calling, if you will. And so you can imagine the president's wife got many visits. <laughs> And so instead of go, having to go visit everyone in Washington society, she would send a bouquet instead. So in addition to a bouquet man, there was also a delivery person uh, on the staff at the White House whose job it was to deliver bouquets. It was for a while a man, and then it was a woman, which struck me because it was the only woman's name I had seen in the gardening staff. And it turned out it was that that the man's mother. So I don't know whether the man went off to the army and then, then she took over the job. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Well, I have three sons, so I should have three bouquet mans, I think. I'm going to have to train them. They can follow the White House. <laughs> they yes, can follow the yes. White House instructions here. But I, I loved that because it was so descriptive. Here's how he does it. This is what it looks like. And you could almost see that thing coming together in your mind's eye, how they had that bouquet built. The size of a cabbage. <laughs> the size of a cabbage. That's right. Well, the late 1800s kick off with the wedding of Grover Cleveland. This is what you coined the Gilded Gardens, the chapter called Gilded Gardens. What are some of the extravagances that especially stood out to you? So the late 19th century was really over the top. I mean, there are people who call us the new Victorians, but, you know, it, it was really a period of a lot of consumerism. Uh, we didn't just invent that. And it came out in the gardens. So the plants kept getting bigger. So there were things like pannas and giant pampas grass, all the carpet bedding, you know, very intricate, very labor intensive. Um, again, all the glass houses to grow things like orchids and roses and camellias and propagate annuals. So it, it was it was really crazed. I'm, one garden writer said he visited the White House and there were two massive beds of crotons. Do you know what those are? Those yes. kind of multicolored tropical plants. Yeah. Uh, each bed was 25 feet across and had 350 plants in it of 75 different varieties of crotons. I mean, if you went to a garden center, you might be able to get two varieties of crotons. I don't even know where you'd begin to find 75 different varieties of crotons. So it was, it was wild, a wild time. And uh, Carolyn Harrison, so she's the first lady of, and wife, uh, Benjamin Harrison, um, she had a plan. She wanted to let go really large. She had a plan to extend the White House, basically uh, copy it and put another one uh, sort of connected, all with glass houses, and then giant conservatory domes full of plants and big fountains in the middle. She was going to, she was going to make it a palace, but hmm. that didn't go anywhere. <laughs> wow, yeah, it's crazy because I mean, I only know of one type of croton. I can't even imagine. And then back then, they didn't even have like seventy five percent off sales, so they were going whole <laughs> hog here, weren't they? I think they were really good propagators, though. Is that what you they know, were we doing? Sort of 
yeah, we've lost some of that art where, you know, it's so easy to just go buy a six pack or something. Yeah. <laughs> or go buy a flat. Yeah, you're right. Uh, but then they were really, they grew things on. So hmm. they had that. Well, the dimensions of that uh, that Croton field, <laughs> which is which is what I think of it as when I was reading that, is I, to me it sounds like it would look kind of almost like a cornfield. Yeah, a little garish too. Yeah, so a really garish cornfield. We could have a Croton maze. <laughs> Croton maze. <laughs> I, I don't think I've had a Croton uh, house plant since I was like out of college. I don't think I've. <laughs> Had one since then, but wow! And I didn't know that they came in seventy-five different varieties. Who oh, knew? Who knew? I'll have to look into that. Well, you also shared a picture of a campaign button for President McKinley in the Still Growing Podcast group on Facebook, and it's also in your book. He loved carnations, but his wife preferred pansies. Tell us about this first family in terms of the garden. So William McKinley did love carnations. And the gardeners are very attentive, as you can imagine, to the incumbent and his, you know, his floral desires or interests. And so they would deliver a nice fresh bouquet of carnations to his desk every day. And he also always had a boutonniere, right? Always wore a fresh carnation in his lapel. Uh, And in fact, so Teddy Roosevelt was William McKinley's running mate and vice president. And in the election of 1900, their campaign button said, we will bloom again for McKinley and Roosevelt. And so this was like a really big deal. So you had, you know, the button had a carnation on it. Um, Ida Saxon McKinley, it, it, it's sad. She was, uh, she had epilepsy, which at the time was basically untreatable. Um, he, she was very dear to her husband, but she was always uh, sickly. And so she would often sit in the conservatory. It was a place where it was quiet and, you know, good humidity and very beautiful. And so there are pictures of her sitting there uh, that are very sweet. And she outlived her husband by many years because he was assassinated. So he was shot actually in Buffalo, New York. And that is when Teddy Roosevelt became president. So he was not, the first term he wasn't elected. He was actually the vice president who assumed well, there's a little-known fact, and no one could have predicted that outcome. No. So, you know, life is, life is short, and we need to enjoy every day. Well, that is the perfect segue into Teddy Roosevelt, because when Teddy Roosevelt became president, garden culture had been changing at the same time, and he begins by introducing recreation into the White House garden. In fact, this change is punctuated with the departure of White House gardener Henry Pfister. Can you highlight some of the big changes that took place in the White House garden? once Roosevelt moved into the White House? So Henry Pfister was the head gardener for 25 years. Um, He came in with the Hayes, Rutherford B. uh, and Lucy Hayes, stayed for 25 years, managed the glass houses, and also all of those elaborate beds that were outside, so all those pattern beds, uh, and was a very dedicated gardener. Um, But he was... He had that Victorian style. So the Roosevelts, Teddy Roosevelt uh, and his wife, Edith, they were young. They had this big family, and they wanted more space. And so Roosevelt basically demolishes the the, uh, glass houses and puts on the predecessor to the West Wing so that he could live in the regular part of the White House and have executive offices that were attached. And so with that, all of the old garden goes. Uh, Out goes the Victorian, and in comes colonial revival. And out (laughs) goes Henry Pfister, who was, I I guess they considered him redundant after the glass house was spent. So a little sad. So they did put in the tennis courts at that time. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt's cabinet was called the Tennis Cabinet because he loved to play tennis. And I just, the the Roosevelt kids make wonderful subjects for anyone like me who is looking for good stories because uh, the two youngest boys, Archie and Clinton, were really naughty and got into all sorts of trouble in the garden. 
And Teddy Roosevelt wrote these really charming picture letters to his children, which I did not know before I I started this. So that was another real discovery for me uh, that were very charming. And I, you know, Teddy Roosevelt was an amazing person. So it was great to learn more about him as well. Mm. Well, now we come to the section of the book I was waiting for, the plant that D.C. is known for, the cherry tree. And I knew the story of how they came to D.C., but for others who aren't familiar, how did the cherry tree get introduced, and what is the connection to the White House? So, the cherry trees in Potomac Park that we all all think of now as the Cherry Blossom Festival was really due to a sort of triumvirate. Uh, There was a woman named Eliza Sidmore, who was a journalist and a traveler who was particularly smitten with Japan. Uh, David Fairchild, who was the USDA kind of head of plant introductions. Uh, And then the first lady, Helen Taft. So Sidmore had been kind of lobbying people to plant cherry trees. Uh, these ornamental cherry trees, to to mimic the bloom festivals that she saw in Japan, which is called Sakura. And David Fairchild already was interested in the cherry tree and was trying to, you know, sort of promote them for Arbor Day. Uh, And uh, Sid Moore got in touch with Helen Taft and, and said, you know, I think we should do this. I think we should have this big planting. And she really got on board. Um, Another thing that was, a new new learning for me was that uh, that Taft had been the I guess Governor General of the Philippines. So after the Spanish American War, the Philippines was I guess almost a colony, hmm. and Taft had been uh, the governor. So his wife was sort of first lady of the Philippines for a while, and they had uh, kind of designed you know had a designer come in and design the city of Manila along with a big park that she particularly liked. And so she wanted Potomac Park to be like that. And so she coordinated the gift of cherry trees. The first batch had to be burned because it was actually uh, infested with insects, I think. Oh, wow. And, but then, yeah, yeah, that was not a good day for the project. Um, and then they got another set of trees and planted them, and it was quite successful from 1912 forward. It, it's always been a tradition. Hmm. Well, here's a term that I didn't realize had a connection to the White House. Uh, so this was new to me, the term American Beauty. Yes, the American Beauty Rose. So this truly is what's in a name, or it's a lesson in good marketing. Um, a White House head gardener, one with a short term, he was only there for two years. His name was George Field. Uh, He left and opened his own nursery with his brother, still in in the district. And he had a friend who was a gardener on a nearby estate and got word that they had a new rose that they had selected. Um, Again, they were hybridizing at the time. And the rose was called, and excuse my terrible French pronunciation, La Madame Ferdinand Germain, I believe is the way you would pronounce it. Okay. So Field either uh, was given a cutting or stole one, it's not clear which, and rebranded it as the American Beauty Rose and promoted the heck out of it. And it went large. So that's one of the things he's famous for. Wow. And American Beauty is such a term now in gardening. You hear it all over for names of plants, names of companies. So it's Absolutely. Stuck. Yeah. Absolutely. And I doubt they're paying George Field's heirs. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> well, enter Beatrix Jones Ferrand, right? This is your uh the person that was so inspiring to you. And she's a female pioneer in American horticulture. Uh, she liked to claim that she came from a family of five generations of gardeners. How did she get under the skin of Colonel Spencer Cosby, the engineer responsible for the White House? And what impact did she have on the White House garden? Set the stage for us. Yes, well, Miss Jones was from a very wealthy New York family, and she studied landscape design and horticulture at the Arnold Arboretum in Boston. 
then took the grand tour with her mother. You know, she was in that social set. Uh, she, her, she was the niece of Edith Wharton, to give you a, an idea. And uh, she knew the first Mrs. Wilson. So I think Woodrow Wilson, Ellen Axon Wilson, his, his, his first wife. And she had met her at Princeton. So Wilson had been president of Princeton. And Beatrix, at the time, Jones, was the consulting landscape architect. First female landscape architect, uh, actually, in America, if you will. And so Ellen Wilson calls this kind of friend, so kind of the same social set, and says, I would like a new garden for the White House. Uh, and so Beatrix designs a, a sort of Italianate garden. Now, this is all fine and good, but there are employees at the White House, and it's their job to do the garden design. And these employees were actually part of the Army Corps of Engineers, which is why it's Colonel Spencer Tosti. Okay. And so they get this plan, and the plan has like a seven-page plant list with kind of snooty, I have to say, instructions <laughs> about, you know, I cannot too strongly, you know, state the necessity of getting good plant, you know, good plant material or something like that. You know, it's... <laughs> For someone who already knew their business, to hear this, and I have to think at the time was also hear it from a woman. A woman, <laughs> yes. I was just thinking that. Yes. Uh, you know, must have been tough. I mean, Frederick Law Olmsted said of Beatrix, she was somehow inclined to dabble in landscape architecture. So, you know, she had a hard, <laughs> hard, hard row to hoe, as they say. Um, anyway, she designs an Italianate garden for the first Mrs. Wilson, who sadly dies before it can be installed. And Woodrow Wilson, I think almost a year to the day from his first wife's death, remarries. Um, and so it is the second Mrs. Wilson who actually installs the Italian aid card, according to a somewhat modified plan. But there's the story, but there's much more in the book about, oh, there <laughs> about is. fascination of, of these two people. Because I think they were two very talented people, Colonel Cosby and Dietrich Brand, and they uh, really rubbed each other the wrong way. Yes, they did. <laughs> they did. Well, speaking of trying to get along with people, in 1939, the British monarchy were set to come to the White House, and First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt was worried that the White House gardens would not measure up to British standards. But she also had a sense of humor about it. And there's this little story that you tell that's classic Eleanor Roosevelt. And as a dog owner myself, it made me chuckle because, of course, there's a special charm that only dogs can bring to a garden. Oh, yes. So here's what she said. Uh, well, Roosevelt worried how the presidential gardens would rate in comparison to those of the British monarchy. Looking out her White House window, she wrote, the railings of the steps leading down to the garden are covered with honeysuckle in bloom, and the big magnolia tree planted by Andrew Jackson has opened wide its blossoms. England is a land of beautiful gardens and flowers, but I do not think the magnolia will be duplicated there. Her humor broke through when she mentioned Franklin Jr. brought his great Dane to stay until he takes him to Hyde Park, which will add a home-like touch to the South Lawn. <laughs> a home-like touch. Yes, I have a home-like touch on my lawn as well, thanks to Sonny. <laughs> <laughs> I, I need your dog to come chase groundhogs. Oh, you can have him. I tell you, Marta, for the last, uh, easily for the last 20 minutes, he's always in the office when I'm doing an interview. And uh, occasionally he'll fall into uh, sleep so deeply that he starts snoring. And as he's <laughs> snoring, I just pick up a pen and I start flinging it at him. And I kid you not, there's like 20 pins on the floor right now. I have to keep potting my volume down so that his snoring doesn't interrupt our interview. So, well, I'm either soothing or boring. I don't know which. <laughs> soothing, soothing, definitely soothing. <laughs> well, we're talking history and gardening, and he has to put up with a lot of that around here. So. <laughs> oh, man. Well, um, it's relaxing to him. Well, in your chapter on the 1940s uh, through the 1990s, you begin with Harry Truman. 
And you write that some presidents wanted the help to be invisible, but not so with Truman. In fact, you relay a story of him walking to the Oval Office and the gardeners uh, all of a sudden see him and they crouch down behind the rose bushes, which made Truman say, why are all these people peeping at me? And then you write of his home in Missouri. And um, I, I have a funny story. My, my dad grew up in Sibley, Iowa. So the Sibley, Iowa, senior class trip. This would have been in the mid-60s. I don't know where their actual destination was, but they stopped by Truman's home in Independence, Missouri, and he was out on his porch uh, actually holding a sprinkler. He was watering uh, his flowers, and he greeted my dad's class just like they were neighbors. Didn't stop watering the lawn. I think he was smoking a cigar, and the whole time, he's watering this garden on his front porch. But it made uh, what you shared in the book come alive to me because Truman loved porches, and that changed the White House. <laughs> that's right. And that's a wonderful story, Jennifer. I can just imagine it. Um, if any of your your listeners are interested in Truman, do read that big um biography by David McCullough, which is wonderful. But Truman liked to have some outdoor space that was somewhat private. Now, you know, imagine living at the White House. You're sort of under everyone's lens, right? You're It's your home, but yet you're kind of limited in terms of the amount you can use it in various ways. So Truman wanted a porch that he and Bess, who really wasn't crazy about living at the White House, could use that would not have them on display. And he suggests that the south portico, the rounded one, that a balcony be put out at the second floor level. And so, you know, he proposes this, you know, people are really up in arms about it. They call it Truman's Porch, blah, blah, blah. (laughs) But eventually he gets his way. And it cost a grand sum of $15,000. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Sounds like a bargain. Yes. Uh, And they didn't get to use it for long because the White House was really having structural problems at the time. And they ended up having to move out. And a huge renovation was done to kind of shore the building up. Um, I guess they had taken some shortcuts when they rebuilt after the burning in 1814. Well, and I guess after the after the rose belt, it's a, a redo. And then they thought, hey, we saved all this money buying the porch, right? Because it was only $15,000. Now we need to <laughs> renovate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they really renovated. They like dug up all the front lawns and put in bomb shelters. And, you know, it was it was that period in American history as well. Oh, crazy. But his boxwoods are still there that he planted. Well, we're getting into the modern era, and when the Kennedys arrived, the fashion-forward renovations that Jackie had done in the White House extended out to the White House grounds. And you tell the story of Jackie Kennedy comparing the White House lawn to a lawn on their weekend retreat in Middleburg, Virginia. And at this retreat, the lawn was cut every two weeks and the grass looked like green velvet. But when Jackie looked at the White House grounds, she said they looked as well as the cornfields in Virginia. So she was not very happy about it. Now, into this picture comes Rachel Lambert Mellon, or Bunny, which is the nickname that she got from her mom and as she was known and referred to. Now, she died in 2014. She was very long-lived. She died on St. Patrick's Day, and she was 103 How did Bunny change the White House grounds? So one surprise to me was that while Jacqueline Kennedy was, you know, sort of interested in the garden, John Kennedy was the one who was really committed to changing the garden. So he he was the one who first contacts Bunny Mellon, who was a family friend, to do a new plan for the Rose Garden. which does include a large lawn, right? It has to seat a thousand people. There's a little design <laughs> design <laughs> specification for you. Um, and 
he wanted something that was traditional. Again, remember, we're back to wanting to use antiques. So when Jacqueline Kennedy does the interior of the White House, she brings back a lot of the old antiques um, and something very gracious. And so it's a very traditional plan. It's the one that's still in place uh, at the White House. Uh, there aren't as many roses as you might imagine, in the Rose Garden. There are some. And then um, sort of anchoring magnolias and a lot of use of of annuals as well. So, uh, and then Kennedy, John Kennedy, was really obsessed with the lawn. Um, He would rope it off so that people wouldn't walk across it. It's hard to grow in Washington, D.C. So Middleburg, Virginia is like horse country. That's like bluegrass country, and it's up a little higher in elevation. Washington, D.C. is really hot and humid, and grass does not like to grow there. So it was always an issue. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) So Funny Melon does the Rose Garden. They put it in. Um, Again, it's a little problematic to work at the White House because you dig things up, like, oops, they cut through the national security line and kind of triggered an atomic alert. Oh, my gosh. It's called Before You Dig. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Um, Oh, and then she did a design for the East Garden. So if you think of the White House being kind of symmetrical, the West Wing on one side, then the East side has a mirror garden that she designed for the First Lady, but it was about to go in when the Kennedys left to Dallas. Oh, so all the work was halted. It was just a very poignant story. Again, I found some of the original letters and things, but no time. But yeah, at any rate, that goes in during the Johnson administration. So yes, she had a big impact. And again, those gardens are still in place. So, well, definitely a lasting legacy and a tribute to her as well. Well, next up is the Rose Garden. And of course, Rose Garden diplomacy is something Jimmy Carter employed as a setting for his talks with foreign diplomats. And of course, he was a farmer himself, so he was very comfortable being outside. He appreciated the historical significance of the trees and the plants on the White House grounds in a way that was very unique to him. Yes. So, you know, the White House as all these plants planted by various presidents over time. And Carter brought many seedlings and cuttings back to Plains, you know, to Plains, Georgia, where his farm was. And he also planted some trees from Plains on the White House grass. He was very interested in the plants themselves. Amy, I think, had, his daughter Amy had a project that required her to identify the various trees, so he had all the trees labeled. <laughs> and uh, he even built a treehouse out one of the big cedars for his daughter, Amy. So it was very sweet. Very Actually, sweet. if you go to the Carter Library now, which is in Atlanta, uh, they've done, they have beautiful grounds, but uh, Rosalind Carter has done a big pollinator garden there. Oh, so she's on trend. She's all over it. Absolutely. Well, let's pretend that you and I are going to visit the White House today. I know you were able to visit. In fact, you write about that in the epilogue, and I absolutely loved that. I thought it was one of the best epilogues that I've read in a long time. So I'm bringing my camera, and I'm ready to go. What would you be particularly excited to show me in the Obama presidential gardens? Well, the thing that I found most impressive really were the trees. They have the most beautiful specimen trees, and they're very well cared for. In fact, all, the White House grounds are beautifully tended. Um, of course, to me, I was very excited about the kitchen garden because I have a couple of community garden plots, and so I was very interested in the vegetables, and um, I just think that's really fun. And I hope that whoever is elected, they keep the kitchen garden. So there's a there's my plug. For, um, for the kitchen and, garden, Yes. <laughs> Yeah, my plug for the kitchen garden. Um, And right next to the kitchen garden, and I did not know this, there is a pollinator garden there. And it's all local plants, local to the mid-Atlantic states. You know, very, very lush. And then, of course, the beehives are right there. So that was super fun to see the bees going in and out. Uh, Tell the story. There's a stag, right? There's a deer, a statue of a deer. (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, that's right. So I was looking for this because I had seen in an old newspaper article that Irv Williams, who is the he's the person who had the longest tenure as head gardener. I think he was head gardener for something like forty years. He wrote about uh, a statue, which was I think a gift. I can't remember who from uh, a gift to the White House. And he placed it outside the Oval Office. So it's a big statue. It's like a, I don't know if it's a life-size statue of a, a, a deer, a male deer with a big stand of antlers. Stand? That's not the right word, but you know what I mean. Yep. Brack. And uh, he put it out there because of Harry Truman and Truman's famous saying, go ahead. The buck stops the buck. here. <laughs> right. And I thought, will it still be there? And I'll be darned. There it is. In the, it's really tucked into a hedge. So it's not obvious. If you weren't looking for it, I don't think you'd see it. But there is a direct line of sight to the Oval Office, to the windows of the Oval Office. So That's the president awesome. can still look up, turn around, look out the window, and see that box. <laughs> and be reminded. Hopefully he knows the story. And be reminded. And so be I reminded. Super- I'm the decision maker. That's right. Well, we're excited about that. That's awesome. I, I'm sure for you, it was just uh, one revelation after the next, right? Because you've done all this research and then you get to go there and, and it all falls in place. Yes. And I will say the White House grounds are open kind of as an open day, open weekend, usually twice a year, unless there's some, you know, unforeseen circumstances for the public. You have to get a timed ticket. They don't always announce the date in advance, but it's usually once in the spring and once in the fall. So, you know, if there's some flexibility or you just happen to be lucky and are there, you can get in. It just takes a little doing. We had to drive down from New Jersey that day. Wow. How great is that, though? I I bet it was a nice capstone to the book. It was indeed. It was indeed. And I will say the head gardener, the current head gardener, Jim Adams, I did have a, you know, a a morning that I spent with him sort of prodding around <laughs> the 18 acres and he couldn't have been more gracious. Wow. And, and mentioning the 18 acres, it doesn't seem like there's 18 acres there. Yes, I agree. But again, think about the, it's got a tremendously big lawn and the building itself is substantial, right? So that's all covered. And the lawn is kept open sort of by, it's part of the plan, the Olmstead plan so that there's a clear line of sight to the Washington Monument, which is a very beautiful view. And then there are lots of trees. So, you know, it's sort of jam-packed with the other things. Yeah. Well, you close the book with uh, some reference sections, and then one of them that I really liked, and that was featuring all the first gardeners. You could write a book on just that alone, the 14 men that have planted for the presidents. And there are no women in the group, so maybe someday we'll see a woman gardener. Yeah, no women yet. <laughs> I'm no sure there women will yet. be someday. <laughs> What are your thoughts on this group of men as you think about them collectively? So it is a really dedicated, hardworking group of people. You know, over time, they have interesting stories. I I started to kind of get sidetracked in while I was writing the book because I wanted to keep putting in a lot of biographical information about the gardeners. So I decided that I needed to corral it and that's why I put a section, a separate section on it, because I just couldn't lose it. They're, they, uh, you know, you don't always get to hear about the gardener. You see the beautiful space, you see the results. So that's why it was fun to I, write about. You know, yeah. there's been some scandal and some <laughs> <laughs> some turnover, but, you know, mostly it's just been people working hard and staying at a job that they clearly love, right? It, even... When I met the staff, the current staff uh, on the ground, and we went around the table, they were on break. They had all been, you know, it was like, I've been here 30 years, I've been here 27 years, I've been been here 38 years, I've been here 18 years. You know, it's just people stay there. And they work really hard because they also do all the event setup. So, you know, the chairs go in, the chairs go out. (laughs) 
Huh. Yeah. So they're very busy. Cocoa Gardner's job. Well, there was another, they're just like us moment. I listened to another interview that you had given and you said that when you were with him, he was weeding as he went. And of course he's tucking them in his pocket and they're kind of sticking out of his pocket. Just like we all do when we're out in the garden, you see a weed, you grab it and fill your apron. Just you know, everyday gardeners, right? Out there doing what they need to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they, you know, it's just, it's a garden that we can all be proud of. Yes. uh, You know, it's just, it's a very beautiful space. Now, I removed the beautiful book jacket as I was marking up your book for the interview, just so that I could keep it looking brand new. And I noticed there's an embossed flower on the cover. What is that? And what's the significance to the White House grounds? Oh, I'm so glad you did. Because, you know, the, the dust jacket is pretty, but the, the actual cover of the book, I think they did a beautiful job on. The, the picture is a water lily. And water lilies in the, you know, mid to late 19th century, they were grown on in the conservatories at the White House, and they were used in the fountains as well. And so they are really a part of White House garden history and American garden history because aquatics were really huge. And the sort of 19th century phenomenon of all of these interesting kinds of unusual and exotic plants. And so I'm glad they chose that. I think it's a very beautiful image. And we have a lot of lovely native water lilies, uh, as well as really pretty exotic ones, too. Yeah. Well, it was kind of a fun surprise. You know, you take the jacket off. I wasn't expecting anything. And I'm like, oh, look at that. It's beautiful. So So they adorned the fountain. They adorned the fountain. Yes. And are they also in that Jacqueline Kennedy area of the garden? Yes, I think, you know, now that you mention it, I do think there, there are on the, there's a little pool... Um, and then there's a lovely statue by a Chicago sculptor by, uh, named Sylvia Shaw Judson. She's the one who did the bird girl on the cover of Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know that image? So she did this little statue. She's, she's no longer alive, but I think you can buy, still buy replicas of her statues. So in the First Lady's Garden... There is a the statue of a young girl with a watering can, and I think that's near the pool, and the pool does have little water lilies in it. That's hmm. very sweet. Yeah, very sweet. Well, Marta, this has been delightful. You have some upcoming events. You have a lot of upcoming events. You're very busy promoting your book and speaking at different events all over the country. If people want to find out where they can uh, see you live, you have them all listed on your webpage. Is that right? Yes, they can see it all on my uh, website, which is www.martamcdowell.com. That's great. And you're very active on Twitter. Yes, yes. So, you know, please follow me on Twitter. And I always put pictures of my garden there and pictures of gardens I'm visiting and little bits of events and things like that. Well, that's lovely. You know what I should tell you? Stay tuned because my next book, which will be out in 2017, coming right up, is about the plants and places of Laura Ingalls Wilder. Oh, wow. That's exciting. Well, you know, being from Minnesota, going to the Laura Ingalls Wilder pageant every summer growing up, that was a big part of my childhood. So that'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah, it was a lot of fun and, uh, you know, brought me through a different part of American landscape history. So that was, again, really an interesting, fun project. Wow. Prairie. I bet you spent some time learning about the prairie. Yes. Well, my mother was from central Illinois, so we would spend our summers on the prairie anyway. Oh, there you go. Wow. That's awesome. Well, that I look forward to that. That'll be great. Well, Marta, you have generously offered to give one of your books away to a lucky listener. So I thank you for that and for all of your time today sharing the information about all the president's gardens. This was just tremendous. Well, thank you for reading the book so carefully. It was really a treat. I love your book. Well, you know, I'm very much active on Ancestry and I did notice at the very end you'd thanked Ancestry, so I was tickled you brought that up. There is such a treasure trove on Ancestry.com. It's just, you can lose yourself there. It's awesome. It, it's amazing. I mean, they one of John Oosley's descendants sent me a photograph of a silver cup that he had won in a horticultural show. 
Oh, I mean, gosh. how would you find that otherwise? You wouldn't. No, you have to go Just to the family. Wouldn't. Yep, no, you would and not. So it, it was really great, you know, for someone like me who really gets so much pleasure out of the obscure. Yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> you know, I just love that stuff. Yeah, and they're very generous. Well, I started that probably about eight years ago. And I have a dear friend, Judy, who's been a lifelong genealogist. And she was a little disgusted with me my first year of being on Ancestry.com because she's like, Jennifer, it took me 10 years to uncover, you know, things that you're uncovering in a, in a couple of weeks because now it's all online. And some of the charm of going to the the historical societies or the libraries or family members, you know, all that hard work for her, it just was like, wait a minute. And now you can just click and it's there and they get a little proprietary about it, especially if they did have to go and, you know, uncover all these things. So, yeah. Well, it's why in, you know, in my sources, I try to give people leads like, you know, go on newspapers.com. It's pretty easy now compared to what it used to be to find these sources. Wow. Thank you so much, Marta, again. This was the highlight of my year, probably, talking to you today. Jennifer, it's been my pleasure. It's been a ton of fun. Well, that's it for the show today. I want to thank my guest, Marta McDowell of All the President's Gardens for being my guest. Holy cats, this was such a treat for me today. And if you enjoyed the show and you want to thank Marta, go buy her book. Go get All the President's Gardens for yourself or for a family member for Christmas. That would be a great gift for the gardener in your life. Well, I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions, David Myers, I'm Kadena and David Gregerson, and also my podcast production is assistant Taylor Davey. Just a reminder that I'll have all the information that Marta shared on the show today over at my website at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. And then just look under the Still Growing Podcast tab and you'll see the show notes for this episode. And all of the links and the resources that Marta mentioned will be in the show notes. And if you really like the show, I'd like to invite you to join the Still Growing Podcast group on Facebook. That's the listener community for the show. It's a great place to ask questions. You can connect with other listeners of the show and you can connect with the great guests of the show, just like Marta McDowell. Marta is in the group, along with Joel Karsten of Straw Bale Gardens, Deborah Madison of Vegetable Literacy, Anna Thomas of Vegan Vegetarian Omnivore. And of course, here's the secret. It's also where I post all of the awesome promotions and garden giveaways from my guests and sponsors. And today, Marta is giving away a copy of All the President's Gardens for a lucky listener. But you have to be in the group. You've got to be in that still growing podcast group on Facebook. So go ahead, check it out. I'd love to meet you in the group. Next week, I'll be talking to Katie Dubow of the Garden Media Group. And we are going to be taking a glimpse into the future, talking about the 20. 17 Garden Trends Report. And this is a fascinating interview about all kinds of different topics that you can incorporate into your plans for next year's garden. I hope you'll join us. Until then, have a great week, everyone. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a sixfootmama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is a weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Well, Marta, I have to tell you, I so I have, um, I don't know how old you are, but I'm 46. And um, in the last week and a half, I think I've started to have hot flashes. Have you ever had a hot flash? Oh, God, yes. Well, I, so. they're all new to me, and I didn't know what to do. And I, <laughs> I got a you get water. ready. Oh, I just can't believe it. It's like I was telling a friend. I'm like it to me. It feels like someone broke open a hot candle and wax. The feeling is like hot wax <laughs> pouring over the top <laughs> of my head. And then um, I went out to the garage and I got one of the kids' sports bottles that squirts. <laughs> That squirts a fine mist of water. I don't know what else to do. I'm beside myself. So I'm interviewing, and then I get this roasting over my head. I can't believe it. Oh, God.
gosh, I had no idea. Well, I mean, you hear about it, you know, people joke about it, but when you actually experience it for the first time, it's a little unsettling. Well, yeah, you go like, oh my God, do I have malaria? (laughs) I know I I was thinking Zika. Like, okay, what's going on? I know. (laughs) 